So I'm here, um, my name is Moisan Mostafavi, and I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Design. And really, it's a great pleasure to welcome you and to be able to welcome Mohammed to the GST. He's not a stranger to this landscape, having spent a long time doing his PhD here um, a few years ago. And, and I'm very happy that, uh, that he's here. He's here under the auspices of the Aracon program at the GST, we have, there's a program that exists between Harvard and MIT, and uh, we all bring uh, wonderful visitors to, uh, to both institutions. And uh, recently, there have been uh, quite a few uh, speakers. Last Monday, I think we had Nora Kawi, and soon we'll also have Anna Herringer here. Yara, Yara, we will also have Yara uh, Shrawi, who will come from London. So um, it's really great to, to have Mohammed here. Uh, Mohammed has been a friend of uh, the GSD even when he's been afar in, uh, in Jordan. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful that uh, we're able to welcome him here. Uh, in, in addition to these um, events that are organized and uh, they're organized uh, um, uh, on multiple levels, we actually have uh, what we call our option studios, which are also the Aga Khan option studios. And, uh, and recently, there have been quite a few um, under the rubric of the Aga Khan program in uh, China, a studio that, uh, that Zhang Ke has conducted in sort of the context of Muslim societies in China. And uh, Marina Tabassum, from Bangladesh has done a studio, and a group of students are actually working now on building five houses in Bangladesh. And uh, in the last day or two, a group just got back from Bangladesh working with Anna Herringer, uh, uh, which is, is also going to be doing projects in the, in the region. Uh, uh, in addition to these, we also have next Tuesday um, uh, Christopher Hawthorne, who's the chief design officer for the city of Los Angeles will give a talk, and Anna Herringer's talk will be on November 13th. So uh, in addition to these events, the Aracon program is also supporting our doctoral students with research in the, in the Muslim world. So please um, help us, advise us with any thoughts or suggestions or recommendations that you have. Um, uh, we have Dana Sheikh, who's here with us today, who's really responsible for organizing all these, uh, all these events related to uh, the Aracon program, who works very closely with um, Paige Johnston. Uh, Mohammed Al-Assad is the founding director of the Center for the Study of the Built Environment in Amman. Uh, it's an independent, private, nonprofit think tank. Uh, sometimes he calls it the do thing, doing things. Uh, uh, to, to, uh, to make things happen, and he's been doing that since 1999. Uh, he's an architect by profession, uh, was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign before coming uh, to Harvard to uh, do his doctoral uh, research here. He also then continued to do postdoctoral work at Harvard at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Princeton, and um, uh, has then um, been very much involved with multiple institutions as a faculty member before um, establishing the center in Amman. He's also, in addition to those, um, to those uh, uh, multiple uh, positions, has been the Alan Kay and uh, Leonardo Lang Distinguished Visiting Professor at his alma mater, which is probably a very nice thing for you to, to have done. Uh, Mohammed is the author of uh, many uh, publications, including Contemporary Architecture and Urbanism in the Middle East, which came out in 2012. And he co-edited a publication called Shaping Cities, Emerging Models of Planning Practice, together with Rahul Marotra, which is based on a conference that we actually did together uh, in Singapore, uh, which uh, was also uh, um, uh, an important, I think, event for the Aracon program. And another publication on workplace is The Transformation of Places of Production, Industrial Buildings in the Islamic World. And he is the contributing editor to the forthcoming 21st edition of Sabanista Fletcher's A History 
of architecture. So lots of things and really an incredible uh, level of dedication and commitment to the architecture of uh, the Muslim world, but also really to building an institute, which is very hard thing to do without incredible resources and doing it year after year and being so successful at it. It's going to be really wonderful uh, for us to hear from uh, Muhammad al-Assad. Please welcome Muhammad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohsen. It's wonderful to be back here after all these years. Um, as Mohsen said, I'll be talking about the Center for the Study of the Built Environment, CSBE. Uh, I usually start by using four adjectives for CSB, and in some ways you took the fire out of it. You, you mentioned those adjectives. Uh, we are independent. We do not follow any other institution. We are not under the umbrella of any other organization or institution. We are nonprofit. Uh, we are interdisciplinary, and we are an applied uh, research and study center. Uh, our mission is very simple. We want to see how we can use the disciplines connected to the built environment, architecture, urbanism, uh, landscape architecture, and te building technologies in order to enhance the quality of life for all. Uh, in this presentation, I will be emphasizing a number of themes. One of them is that um, it would be wonderful to um, strive for excellence, and we should all strive for excellence, but we also need to address issues relating to uh, administrative tasks, uh, uh, financial tasks, legal tasks, and if we don't actually give attention to these issues, no um, amount of technical competence or excellence will get us anywhere. The second thing I'd like to emphasize, and I hope this will become more apparent as I speak further, is that it would be wonderful to also be able to make five-year strategic plans and then go about realizing that plans. But you probably know the saying that man plans and God laughs. Uh, basically, um, we are dealing always with an onslaught of challenges and of uh, opportunities. They are unpredictable, they are arbitrary. Um, the challenges sometimes are headaches, sometimes they're actually existential threats, and we need to do our best to basically um, neutralize them. And at the same time, we need to do our best in order to take advantage of whatever opportunities we get. We generally find out that we cannot plan for more than a year or a year and a half. We never know what's going to happen after that period. And basically, uh, we don't, sometimes don't even know if we're going to exist after that period. So um, what we engage in is what I like to refer to as a sort of constructive or positive opportunism. And I think that will become clear as I uh, proceed. Uh, let's move on to the story of, of CSB. Uh, as Mohsen said, I started it in 1999, in the summer of 99, almost 20 years ago. At that time, I had been teaching at the University of Jordan, teaching architecture for about six years, and I felt that it is time for me to make a major career shift. Uh, I resigned from the university and went about establishing the center, and the first person I approached was not someone connected to our disciplines. I approached um, an attorney who was a friend of mine. Uh, we met actually as students here in architecture, uh, here at Harvard. He was studying law, of course. And um, I asked him to help me establish CSB as a nonprofit in Jordan, and he did. And we became the first members of the board of directors at the center. Uh, we invited three others to join us, all three uh, are architects. Two have relocated outside Jordan since then, so we invited two to replace them, one an architect, and another a mechanical engineer who's also a management consultant, and I will refer to him um, later on as we proceed. Um, in terms of our first project, it was really by pure coincidence, as many things have happened with us. Uh, the Germans in Jordan were um, running a project on uh, the city of Petra. It was involved with uh, the conservation of the city of Petra. I knew the team. I had done some work with them. So the head of the team, a German geologist, said, you know, I think we can give you a grant. Uh, they gave us, I think, uh, $3,000. And we agreed that we would do two things. Uh, the first thing is to organize a workshop about the um, use of stone in construction. And uh, we would bring in experts in Jordan to talk about various issues, uh, such as stone and earthquakes, um, about uh, stone dressing, etc. And the Germans would fly in a couple of people to also give some lectures about stone. And the workshop went very well. We were very happy with the results. The second task we agreed to do was to um, do a survey 
on the use of stone as a sheathing material in buildings in Amman from 1900 to 2000. This was the time of the new millennium. And uh, I got a team of former students, and I continued actually to depend on former students of mine for some time to do the survey. It went very well. We were very happy with it. The next issue was uh, documentation. Um, we did not document the workshop. Probably we should have. But we decided we, of course, need to document the results of this survey. And here again, we took advantage of existing opportunities. Um, initially, we thought maybe we should print it, but printing is, of course, very expensive, very time consuming. Uh, at that time, uh, online publishing had become widespread. We now take it as a given. You know, it's almost like indoor plumbing, but I cannot tell you at that time how much of a God-given gift it was for us. For better or for worse, if you had a website, you basically had a publishing house, you know, a, vir a virtual publishing house. And uh, so really there was a transformation, a revolution in the ability of tiny institutions like ours to disseminate information. However, we did not have a website, but again, we had to take advantage of coming opportunities. We approached the ARCnet site. It was just being established here in Cambridge at MIT. It was intended to become the platform for the built environment in the Islamic world. Again, I had some contacts with them. I had worked with them. So I told them, you know, we have this interesting uh, survey. Would you publish it on your website? And they said they would. So then I became greedy and I said, you know, would you actually publish other things we will come up with later on? And they said, you know, if you plan to do that, why don't you start your own website? Then you'll have more freedom and more flexibility to do things. We had no money, but we started our website. And so we had our virtual uh, publishing house. So basically, that was our first project. It went well. We were happy with it. But it was a one-off project in many ways. And we had to start thinking of doing things that were more continuous in nature. And uh, what came to my mind then was, why don't we start a public lecture series? There's nothing unusual or, or creative about that. But what we decided to do is to actually um, invite only lecturers from outside Jordan. Uh, the idea was that lecturers from inside Jordan who spoke about the built environment had platforms to present in their information. But uh, we really needed more interaction with people from outside Jordan. The other thing we thought of doing was an architectural forum. We thought we would bring in like 20 architects. Uh, we would have them meet regularly. At one point, we were meeting once every two weeks. Um, they would get together. We would bring in a speaker. It could be the lecturer. It could be, for example, um, a local speaker. It could be a member of the forum. Uh, here's just an example of them. Here we had the former mayor of Amman. Actually, we brought him in literally a month after he was uh, at, after he left office. And uh, after the person gives the presentation, the idea was that we would have an intensive discussion with him about the subject. And it was a very interesting um, idea. We were very lucky that we were able to initiate our lecture series and this forum session um, with uh, talks by the late William Mitchell, Bill Mitchell. Probably a number of you either know him or know of him. Uh, Bill was a faculty member here at Harvard for quite some time, and at that time he had become the Dean of Architecture and Planning at MIT. Uh, Bill was actually supervising the ARCnet project, and he also had some uh, funds that allowed him to travel and to lecture. Again, luckily I knew him. I had been fortunate enough that I worked under him when I was a postdoctoral fellow here, so I said, Bill, would you come and give us a lecture here in Amman? He said I would. And he came in, we got the Amman municipality to host it, the mayor showed up, 400 people came to attend, so it was quite an event. And then he also gave us the first um, forum uh, presentation. He talked about not just ARCnet, but the future of the design studio in the digital age. He talked about his uh, two books that he had just published, City of Bits and Utopia. It was really a wonderful way of, in some ways, going public. But again, we knew that you cannot always find lecturers who have their own funding to travel and come to Amman. So we had to start thinking, how do we actually get lecturers uh, to fund lecturers to come? Once again, I had to go through whatever contacts I had. I contacted the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. I had been working with them for about 10 years and said, would you help us bring lecturers to Amman? And they said, sure, we would. Then I went to another organization, Darat Al-Funun, 
uh, I think, Mohsen, you visited the Dara when we were there. And uh, it's an art foundation founded by one of the major banking families in Jordan. And I said, would you be willing to join the Aga Khan Award in um, helping us bring lecturers to Jordan? And they said, sure, we would. And they said, more than that, you can use our facilities. They have a wonderful, uh, the wonderful remains of a 6th century Byzantine church. They said, you can use that anytime you want when the weather allows for your lectures. They, of, of course, provided the tables and um, the chairs. And also, they said, you can use our library for your architectural forum. So you can see now, little by little, we now had a lecture series, an architectural forum, and had some funding to proceed. Then we thought, why don't we document what we are doing? Um, some of the lectures and these presentations for the forum were very interesting. Uh, we wanted to go beyond just simply taping or filming the presentations and then uploading them. In any way, the, the bandwidth at that time was actually very slow and, and you could not even do much in terms of uploading. So we thought what we would do is actually um, convert these lectures into articles. And we would do that conversion in cooperation with the lecturers themselves. And for the forum presentations, we even would include the discussion that takes place afterwards. In other words, we would have that kind of added value. All the speakers enjoyed that kind of discussion. And we started with Bill Mitchell's lectures, and it went very well. And, and uh, we published them on our website. So finally, we had something to put on our website. But now we needed to find funding to continue with this. Um, I was doing it on a voluntary basis, but I needed to hire some people uh, to help me do that. And here again, and here I'm talking again about these opportunities, the Aga Khan Award connected me to the Prince Klaus Fund in the Netherlands. And they said, we will help you um, in terms of funding you, publish, funding you to publish these um, lectures and articles. So now we had the lectures and we had also the documentation moving along. Uh, we needed to think of something else to do. And I'm going in some detail just to show you how it is when you start something like this. We thought, why not start on our website a section on architectural news in Jordan? Uh, this was the year 2000. A lot was happening in that part of the world. There was a construction boom going on for various reasons. But nobody was documenting what's going on. We had no clue what was going on. So again, I got an army of former students. We started going to offices, trying to find out what they're being commissioned to do, what they're designing, what they're building, you know, just to get as much information on what is happening in Jordan. And we would scan the newspapers to see information about conferences, regulations, everything we could find. And we really were starting a very interesting process of documenting what was taking uh, place in Jordan. Again, we needed funding. Um, I had run out of organizations I knew, so I had to find other sources. And I sent a call, sort of call to the Graham Foundation in Chicago. I did not know them. I had no contact with them. But I had recalled when I was a student uh, that they had supported the publication of Robert Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. I always admired the late Robert Venturi. I admired the book. And I thought, you know, they, these must be nice guys to have supported Robert Venturi's book. So I sent a letter to them. And the late Richard Solomon, who is the head of the Graham Foundation, wrote me a very nice letter back and said, sure, we'll support you. We'll help you with this. And so we now had this um, architectural news moving on. So within a year to a year and a half, we had this interesting setup, sort of set. We were doing um, interesting original work. We were providing added value. Um, we really had something to offer, not just to people in Jordan, but also to people outside Jordan in relationship to the built environment. The problem was that this was really not very sustainable. Um, we were getting all these tiny grants here and there to help us carry out our work, but we had no money for our overheads, no money to pay salaries. Uh, we couldn't even hire a staff member, not even a junior member. I was doing everything on a voluntary basis. Now, had we been, uh, and this goes back to Mohsen's comment that it's difficult to establish these kinds of institutions in that part of the world, had we been part of a university, the arrangement could have worked. You know, we would be faculty or staff members at the university, um, we would have our salaries, we would have our offices, and then we would get these tiny grants here and there to do our fun projects, and we would find some arrangement with the university administratively and uh, in terms of finances to run the thing. But that was not an option. The regulations in Jordan would not allow for that. And also, we really thought we should value our independence. 
So we thought we now have to start going bigger. We have to start finding some larger grants that would support us. And so this brings us, let's say, to um, phase two or to the um, second episode of the story of CSB. So in um, 2001, we managed to get our first big grant. It was from USAID, the United States Agency for International Development. USAID was starting uh, or was carrying out a water demand project in Jordan. Uh, Jordan is a water-starved country, so donor countries are always developing some project or the other regarding water. Now, I, uh, of course, was interested in this issue, but more specifically, I was interested in water-conserving landscapes. I was interested in what universities such as the University of Arizona were doing in that regard. So, um, in fact, I had some contacts with the University of Arizona. I had given a lecture there earlier, uh, in the early 1990s. When I started CSB, I also had given a lecture to them, but nothing was related to water conserving landscapes. I told them this is a subject of interest to me. And they said, why don't we create a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, so that if and when you develop something for water conserving landscapes, we can work together. And we did. So back to Amman. Um, I used to meet with a colleague at um, Habitat for Humanity. We were hoping to do something on housing. Nothing, nothing ever came out of it. But he knew the water demand management people. And he connected me to them. And I told them, you know, what you're doing is very valuable, but you really should incorporate landscaping. A lot of water in Jordan is wasted in terms of gardening, whether it's private gardens or parks. And we at CSB can help you in terms of um, helping people save money there. You know, we can do research. We can disseminate information on issues such as plant lists, uh, on uh, hardscaping, on irrigation techniques. And we also can bring our colleagues from Arizona to carry out some workshops. And when I told them about Arizona, I think that in some ways tipped the scale. They thought, you know, if the University of Arizona is willing to work with these people, let's give them a chance. So they said, we'll give you a one-year grant. So we finally had some money. We hired someone, a former student of mine again. We got a very small team of part-timers, including myself, to start working on the uh, landscaping project. And we delivered what they asked us to do. You know, we, we published posters, material on our website, um, manuals, all on water conserving landscapes. Uh, we even had workshops with our colleagues at the University of Arizona, and the project actually moved along very well. At the end of the year, they said, you know, um, this is actually an interesting project. It's sort of the um, tail that wags the dog in that uh, we can only get people so excited about water-saving devices you put on faucets, but when you talk to people about plants that need little water or plants that need no irrigation, once they are established, people get excited. So they decided to fund us for another few years until the end of the project, and finally we had some funds sort of coming in and to be able to establish uh, some sort of um, real functioning, though tiny, institution. Then that project came to an end. USAID started another project, and that project also um, continued to fund us for another five years. So we had continuous funding all the way up to 2012. And for that project, we published more material. We started doing sort of uh, short videos about um, water conserving landscapes. And we even started training some of the staff member at municipalities on developing water conserving parks in Jordan. And as usually is the case, then you start getting into other programs or other projects. Um, we became interested in gray water. You know, gray water can be used for irrigation. So we managed to get three small grants. Together, they were actually a sizable grant for gray water. Again, we researched material on it. We disseminated information. We started doing testing on, um, you know, uh, the cleanliness of the, of the water, what kind of uh, problems it has in terms of microbial or in terms of chemical contamination. Uh, we even did a conference, an international conference on gray water and published the results. So basically now um, we finally became a full-fledged think tank. Uh, we had funds, we had uh, overheads, we had staff, a very tiny organization, but finally we became really in some ways um, an actual organization, and not just this simple setup that we had started during our first two uh, years. Then uh, episode three is when we grew into something else. 
and this was a very interesting and a sort of painful process of growth. And it was related to the uh, first water demand management project. They uh, required us to do things that we simply were not ready to do, but they said, you have to do them. So we did them, and we found out once we did them that now our capacity had increased and we had entered a new area. The first project uh, came as follows. The water demand project people said, you know, we, we like what you're doing. We like the fact that you're disseminating information, carrying out workshops, but we want you now to actually build a water conserving park, a model one. Mm -hmm. And to make things more difficult, they said, you know, we, we pay you for your time. We even have some money to help you start with the construction of the park. But you basically have to find an institution that will support you and that will sponsor the process. Um, we weren't sure where to start. Um, we didn't have that good connections with the municipality. They're the main body that would create such parks. And again, one had to be extremely resourceful. And here it occurred to me, there was a park in the city of Amman that I've always really liked. Um, it is the park you see in, 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 you know, uh, inside the uh, red line. It was a two acre park in a nice part of Amman. Um, we think it's the oldest existing park in Amman. Nobody knows. The municipality has no records of it. Um, we think it dates back to 1960. Uh, it had seen better days. It had really suffered from um, all sorts of problems relating to neglect and vandalism over the years. But there was an opportunity. Next to it, and you can see just below it, was the Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts, which is part of the Royal Society of Fine Arts. It's not a very well-known museum, but it actually has one of the largest collections of contemporary art from the Islamic world anywhere. Now, the opportunity was that they bought the building right opposite them. And they were planning to um, develop it as an extension of the park. So we saw an opening here. I had contacts with the National Gallery, so I went to them and I said, I think we really have a very unique opportunity. We have money to design and uh, basically supervise the construction of a park. You're going to expand. Uh, it would be nice if we can rehabilitate this park as a model water conserving park. It will really enhance the environment in which you're in. It will provide you with an open air connection between your two buildings. We can place your um, outdoor sculptures in it. So really, this is an opportunity we should not uh, let go. So they talked to the municipality. They had the ear of the municipality. They told them, would you be interested in doing this? And the municipality said yes. So actually then what happened is that um, the municipality even renamed the park, the National Gal Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts Park, and they did the park. Um, I can talk about it forever. Of course, I don't have the time to do so, so I'll just show you a couple of images. Um, this is the condition of the park as we received it. You can see, I mean, it was really in, in very difficult um, shape. Um, basically, this is the design we developed for it. Uh, Lara Zuriqat, our associate director, was the primary designer for this. It concentrated on trying to maintain many of the older sections of the park, especially the pathways, but we created two plazas, um, this one and that one, and we had a large rainwater collection uh, reservoir right under the main uh, plaza. So uh, basically, this is the park as we uh, developed it. You can see the plaza here in the middle. Um, here is that sort of connection we told the National Gallery about. We're looking from the extension building to the old building, and the idea is that people can walk between the two, and this is just a view of the plaza at ground level. This was inaugurated in 2005, and uh, when the USAID project told us to do this project or to, to, to do a park, we really had no clue what to do, but finally we did it. And with this, and this is what Mohsen said, we finally were transformed from a think tank to a think and do tank. We were finally actually implementing what we were doing. We were actually doing things on the ground, and it was a very important moment for us. The second project that uh, this water demand management uh, project asked us to do, they said, we want you to do a competition about water conserving landscapes. So we said, why don't we do a competition for a house that is water and energy saving? And uh, they said, fine. And they said, again, you know, we give you some money to cover your time. Uh, we can give you some money to cover the um, cost of doing this competition. But again, you need to find a sponsor. You need to find an organization that will sponsor you. A former student of mine was working then with the Aqaba Special Economic Zone Authority. 
Uh, Aqaba is the only port city in Jordan. Um, it became a bit famous after Lawrence of Arabia because it was featured in the film. And in the year 2000, Aqaba was converted into a special economic zone. And so they had money, and they were interested in placing themselves as a center for innovative and new ideas in Jordan. So through the student, we got to them, and we talked to them, and we told them, you know, we have this competition we'd like to do for a water and energy conserving house. Would you like to team up with us on it? And they said, yeah, sure, why not? We can also cover any costs you cannot cover. And they said that uh, we can even set aside a plot in Aqaba as the land for the competition. And we did the competition. Again, it was a very complex event, but we had it. You know, we, we, we brought in a jury. We selected winners, and everything went well. We were very happy with it. But two totally unexpected developments came out of it. The first one, and this is just serendipity, serendipity at play, um, this Jordanian guy was working at the University of Lund in Sweden. Um, he was working in development. He bought a piece of land in Aqaba at that time. He wanted to build a house. He heard about this competition, and he said, why don't I build the house that you have? Of course, he said, I need to make changes. So he told us, I have some money. Why don't we work together? We brought the winners of the first competition, had a closed competition among them. He selected one of them to build. He got a grant from the U European Union to basically cover the costs of all elements connected to water and energy conservation. And uh, the um, requirement of the grant was that the house would be open to the public for a year after its completion, and then um, that uh, we would write a report about the effectiveness and efficiency of its water and energy conserving components. And we did that. The house was actually designed, and the house was built. We wrote the report about it later on. Everything went as planned. Although, a side note, I just heard that actually it's falling apart now. It's been 10 years. This is another main problem we always face, that you do something as you want to do it, you hand it over, and then nobody takes care of it. But that's another story. So um, we, again, enhanced our position as an organization that not just designs things and talks about things, but actually implements uh, projects. So our think-do capacity was enhanced by that project. Then another development came up, which we had not expected. The people at the Aqaba Special Economic Zone Authority said, we like your work. We like to work with you. Um, we can outsource some work for you. We can also maybe use you as a research arm. And they said, why don't you start by developing regulations for us for building signs and building colors in the city of Aqaba? And we did, and they are still in force. Then they said, you know, we need to build some things in Aqaba. We want to build a workers' village. We want to build a new bus station. We want to build also a, an international school. Would you do close competitions for them? And we did, and that went along well, but unfortunately, they were not built. But for us, what was very important out of the second development is we finally established a very close working relationship with a public sector organization that had decision-making authority in the country. And this was a very important relationship for us. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. For about two years, these people moved on. The people who came in their place were not interested in maintaining that relationship. Um, and we have never been able to really to recreate it with another organization, public sector organization. And we consider this probably our main failing because we found out that there are certain things you can only do if you have some sort of partnership with the public sector. But still, for a few years, actually, we were able to have that kind of relationship. So uh, really, by 2008, um, in some ways, CSPE gelled in, into what it is today, into that kind of organization um, that disseminates information, carries out research, and implements a certain number of uh, projects. But then um, something else started happening to us, which is that uh, companies started approaching us for their CSR work, their corporate social responsibility. And, um, the office of Amraniya in Saudi Arabia, it's a major office in the Middle East uh, with presence in the, uh, throughout the, the Middle East, but it's based in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they came to us and said, we'd like to form with you uh, an architectural award for students. The idea was that students of architecture in the Arab world would submit their graduation projects. We would get a jury every year, and we would assess them and give awards to them. And I think they had something like ten to $15,000 worth of prize money every year. And we've been doing it for 11 years now. Here you see the 2016 jury. Mohsen is in the center here. 
Roshin Hennigan from Ireland was on the jury, and Ammar Khamash from Jordan was that on that jury. Was on that jury. Uh, this is a fascinating project. I mean, or, or uh, activity. I can go on forever about it, uh, but uh, I think it really, in some ways, energized students of archi- energized students of architecture in Jordan, um, because basically uh, every year we would carry out. A ceremony to celebrate the winners. Uh, we would do it in different cities in the Middle East, although for the last few years we've been doing it in Amman, Jordan, at the um, rehabilitated 1930s electricity hangar in the city. Um, the students get to present to the audience their projects, the winning students, and then we would have this wonderful exhibition in which every submitted project would be shown as well as all the winner pro- winning projects from the previous years. So it was really a wonderful event of bringing um, the, the um, architectural community and students of architecture and departments of architecture um, together. And we also squeezed it. We did other activities through it. Uh, since we had an impressive jury each time, we would ask one or more of them to give a public lecture. Uh, at one point, we even asked all of them to have a conversation together. We had had um, Murad Tabandi Oglu from Turkey, Shahira Fahmi from Egypt, and Bernard Khouri from um, uh, Lebanon that year. Um, then we started producing movies through the award. We produced through three movies through the award. We just started by one uh, about the award itself, then did one about architectural education, and then we did one of our favorite films, uh, Arab Women in Architecture, a one-hour documentary that was received very well and actually was screened all the way from Tokyo to New York that provided the experience of about 17 uh, Arab women architecture in terms of uh, practice. Uh, so um, here I should also say that um, the digital revolution really helped us carry out those movies. You know, filming became cheaper, editing became cheaper, and also Jordan has been graduating a few filmmakers from two schools uh, who are very talented and we've been actually depending uh, on them. Uh, our, one of our other favorite movies, not connected to the award, is actually this one. It's about the story of uh, Jordanian innovators. Uh, we had one who is an architect. She was, I think, 25 years old when we did the movie. Another one is a software developer. And then these two who did Jordan's first and only automobile, they finally produced 10 before they went broke. And this guy actually is a mechanical engineer I told you about, who is now the... Uh, Uh, head of our board of uh, directors. And we produced almost uh, a dozen movies over the years um, on various subjects relating to the built environment, to innovation, and to subjects of that sort. And as usual, one thing leads to the other. Um, Because of our work on the Omraniya Award, um, this large conglomerate in Saudi Arabia, the Fosan Group came to us. They said, you know, we'd like to uh, establish a uh, an award for mosque architecture uh, to celebrate the, the, the founder of the company. Would you establish it for us? We did that. We managed the first cycle, handed it over to them, and I think now they are going through the third cycle of the award. But really deep down, we've always been a research institution. We never forgot about that. The problem is not everyone likes to fund the kind of projects we would like to do, the research projects. So here, uh, we would spend time whenever we had extra time on research projects. We would take advantage of the presence of interns uh, or of visiting scholars or of exchange students. For example, we had an exchange student from uh, Tufts, Ian James, who spent a year with us. He did a very interesting study on the 1987 and 2008 master plans of Amman. And of course, we publish everything on our website. Uh, More recently, we had a uh, master's graduate in planning from MIT. She spent some time through an exchange program with us, did some work on housing in Jordan. Then after that, a Fulbright scholar from Brown came and expanded on the project. So now I think we have a very valuable study on housing in Jordan that we are just editing and hope to publish on our website um, very soon. Mobility is an issue that is always on our mind. It's a very serious issue in Jordan, everywhere, of course. Um, For example, we did uh, a study that was a lot of fun for the staff on cycling in Jordan. Jordan has a very small but growing cycling community. We even started identifying paths in and around Amman that may be developed into cycling routes with little intervention. Um, And uh, an issue we've been working on for some time is public transportation in the country. Jordan really faces serious problems with public transportation. Here, um, this uh, advocacy group made of Jordanian businessmen said, we have a tiny grant we can give you. It will not cover your costs, but uh, you know, why don't you start a study on public transportation? Our approach is a tiny grant is better than no grant at all, so we took it. And we decided to do a study on the user's experience 
of public transportation. So uh, first of all, we, we did sort of a literature review of everything available on the subject in Jordan, whether it was interviews um, on television or radio, uh, newspaper articles, reports, articles, etc. Uh, we did uh, in-depth one-on-one -on -one, um, interviews with users of public transportation. And we did something else, which is we took 12 lines in and, asa in and outside or around Amman, and we um, followed their route. Interestingly enough, this was 2013, there was not a single public transportation map in Jordan, and we started testing them. Our staff and also um, a few volunteers, we would test the routes, you know, different times of the day, different days of the week, and we came up with some interesting uh, results as a result of this, and of course also published it. And here another interesting opportunity came up. Um, there is an organization by the name of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, FES, a German foundation connected to the Socialist Democratic Party in Germany. The big parties in Germany each has a foundation. They have an office in Amman. The office in Amman is interested in climate change, so public transportation is connected to that. They came to us and they said, you know, um, we like what you did. Uh, we will give you more money to do more work, to continue your work on public transportation. So uh, we told them we'd love to do a policy study. And what we did was something very simple. We um, identified 12 people, uh, former and current officials in Jordan in terms of legislators, regulators, as well as providers of public transportation. And we had extensive one-on-one -on -one meetings with each one of them. And together, collectively, they have a treasure of information about public transportation. No one ever bothered to sit with them and document and analyze what they said. We did that and we um, developed what I think is a very valuable report about the state of public transportation of Jordan out of these um, interviews and we publish it as usual on our website and FES published it in uh, print. And then uh, what is interesting how these things, one thing leads to the other, a sort of um, initiative was formed from a few organizations that decided to create Amman's first public transportation map. It had 70 lines and 12 of the lines were the ones, of course, that we had documented early on. And then after that, um, a, an app, a, a transportation app for trip planning was developed and we also played a role in developing that. Then FES came to us and said, you know, we fund you for another year. What would you like to do with that year? And we said, um, you know, the, the report we did is very valuable, but nobody reads these things. We'd like to actually create a series of very short videos that would um, inform people about developments taking in public transportation in Jordan. So um, the first film was one we did with the first study. We did one on the new public transportation law in Jordan because we felt that can really transform the state of public transportation. We wanted people to know about it. We did one about the BRT, the bus rapid transit system in Amman that is taking forever to finish. And we felt we needed to tell the story of that. Uh, we did a film on the app itself. And we told them, you know, the app has some glitches and there are some issues we'd like to expand upon. So they gave us some money to also fix um, the app itself. And then uh, we came up with what we thought was a really nice idea. We would have a hackathon. We would invite app planners and developers and tell them, you know, design an app for public transportation based on, and that expands upon the first app uh, that had been developed. And we did the hackathon. Um, we had a jury. We gave prize money. Uh, it was covered in the media. But um, actually, none of the results were of any value. And this is an example of a project where you do it as planned, you do everything as you had wished you would do, but it just sort of fla falls flat on its uh, face. And these things, of course, uh, unfortunately, um, also happen. Then FES came to us for a third year, and they said, we'll fund you for yet another year. I think this will be the last year. And here we told them we cannot do anything about public transportation anymore. There's a lot that needs to be done, but if we are to do anything, we have to work in partnership with a public sector organization, with the municipality or with the Ministry of Transportation, and we don't have that kind of partnership. And that, again, reminded us of what we had with Aqaba 10 years ago and how it didn't last for very long, and we weren't able to recreate it with any other organization. And again, I feel this is one of our main failings. We have never been able to keep some sort of close working relationship with the public sector. There always been has that kind of polarization between them and us. And we said, really, we cannot do much more about public transportation. Let's move on to something else. 
um, connected to climate change. We're very interested in urban agriculture. We think this is a very crucial subject. We need to know more about it. A lot is happening all over the world. And uh, our study that's ongoing, should be done in a couple of months, is to see what's happening in Jordan and what can happen in Jordan. So we've been looking at uh, very interesting examples. This is a little farm on the top of a hotel, actually, in Amman. And they have sophisticated systems, including aquaponics, hydroponics, aeroponics, for producing um, plants. And we also looked at, you know, growing vegetables for dummies kits, uh, such as these ones, where you can, anyone can, on their balcony or next to their window, grow um, uh, lettuce or, or uh, basic vegetables, and these are just some of the kits we've been uh, basically working on. Before I move on to our final project, uh, I would like to say something about education. Uh, we're not an educational institution, as CSBE, but uh, our first project had that workshop which had an educational component. We've always felt we should be involved in education. We should offer courses, we should offer, offer uh, workshops, because that's a major way through which information is disseminated. Uh, but we discovered something that probably many know, which is to offer high quality training or classes is extremely expensive. If it's not subsidized, it's almost impossible to do. And we learned that the hard way when we did something called Architectural Laboratory 1. This is Architectural Laboratory 2. And uh, there we had an eight-week design class. Um, the students met seven days a week, from morning to evening, every week. They had a different architectural project every week. We had seven, um, eight architects. Each one would teach them for or instruct them for one week. We had our staff. We had coordinators working with them. The results were remarkable. It was an incredible experience. The students were telling us we learned in those eight weeks more than we did in five years of architectural um, education, but it was unsustainable. It was just far too expensive, far too tiring for us. So when we had architectural laboratory two, the eight weeks became three weeks, and the eight instructors became three instructors, two from GSD, by the way, and there was no architectural laboratory three. So um, we really learned the hard way how difficult it is to carry out high-quality education, especially when you don't have much money. But we've always done small classes and small workshops whenever we had the opportunity. But again, the digital revolution has opened some opportunities for us, and that is open online courses, and more specifically, massive open online courses. Um, the idea is, you know, you spend a lot of resources on one class, but then thousands and thousands of people can, sub, you know, uh, register for the class. And that experience started when IDRAC, it's a non-profit um, uh, MOOC platform in Jordan, founded a few years ago. It's, I think, the largest now in the Arab world. They came to us, they were just starting out, and they said, you know, would you do a class for us, a MOOC? And uh, they, again, they said, we have a tiny grant, we can give it to you, it will not cover your costs. And again, we thought, you know, a small grant is better than no grant. And we did the class. And we were really pleasantly surprised. They had two runs of the course. For each run, 6,000 students registered. Uh, it is now being offered as a self-paced class. They haven't given us, given us the numbers. But we assume that a lot of people are continuing to take the class. And we've discovered this is probably one option we should look at more carefully. And then a couple of years ago, the um, Aga Khan Trust for Culture has revitalized its education program, and of course they wanted to include MOOCs in it. And they said, why don't you do the first MOOC we will do? And we did it. It is on enhancing the quality of urban life. A fascinating project because it's very much connected to the winning projects of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. We just finished it. Uh, we're going through the first trial run of it. I think it started about 10 days ago, so we'll have more information as uh, we move along. And we're planning to do it as a blended class um, next semester where we will have two universities in the Middle East um, who would offer it as a class and the students would take it both online and under the supervision of an instruction. So this is something that we really feel um, has tremendous uh, promise and uh, we'd like to pursue it further more. So to move on to what we are um, doing now, to end. Um, People often ask me, what's your favorite project? And I usually tell them whatever we're working on now. So that's a good sign that we're still excited about what we are doing. Uh, I've shown you some of the projects we're doing now. There are others we are doing, but unfortunately, I don't have time to, to, to show them to you today. A project we just finished, and we're hoping to get more funds to continue with it, is that of developing public school grounds in um, Amman and around Amman through a part participatory design process. We got a grant from USAID, 
and we managed to also get some money from other sources in order to improve the grounds for schools. We've worked on seven schools. Uh, basically, um, the, the, amount, the money has ranged. It's always tiny. Um, I think the least amount is about $3,000, and for one school, we went up to $25,000. The idea is that we give training to the students in architectural design. And um, you know, they, they learn how to draw plans, how to draw sections, how to connect plans and sections to the real world, and so on. And then uh, we tell them, this is the money we have. What would you like to do with the money? How would you like to use it to improve your school? And the students have been tremendously realistic in the ideas that they came up with, in fact. And uh, so for example, in the case of this school, uh, as you can see, I mean, the condition is quite um, horrific. And they said, look, the walls are in horrible shape. They're falling apart. We want you to fix the walls for our yard, to fix it, the yard a bit. We'd like to have some uh, color. Uh, they thought of a floral pattern. They also said, we actually don't even have a canopy to protect us from the shade and from the sun. So why don't we do all of that? And so we developed the design with them, and then we finalize it. And so this is what we came up with them. This was a $4,000 uh, project, and this is another image of it. I can go on forever about this project, so I won't. But instead, I'd like to show you a five-minute video uh, we just produced uh, about it. It only talks about three schools that we did. They were the lower end of the school in terms of the project in terms of uh, budget. So uh, it is in Arabic, but with English subtitles. And so I will show it to you now, and that will be the end of my uh, presentation. Um, so here's the, the video. مدارس عم بتم هدول المدارس بتختلف سواء كانت مدارس بنات لحال او اولاد لحال وفي كمان مدارس مختلطه بعمان وبسحاب وبعين الباشا المدارس هاي كلياتها مدارس حكوميه احنا بنشتغل معاهم مع جلسات تشاركيه جلسات التصميم التشاركي بنعملها مع كل صف بالمدرسه المدرسه الجلسات هاي بتختلف او بتتنوع بين انها سواء لتعريفهم بالمبادئ الاساسيه للتصميم، التصميم المعماري ومختلف انواع التصميم، وكمان بنفس الوقت بتعرفهم على كيف انه هم يكونوا عندهم نقد بناء لمدرستهم ولبيئتهم المحيطه فيهم، وكيف الحلول اللي ممكن يطلعوها للمشاكل اللي بتواجههم. بدنا نتفاجئ بكميه الطاقه اللي عند الطلاب. كمية الكرياتيفيتي الموجودة ما كنا متخيلين انها تكون موجودة، فاحنا حاولنا نوظف هاي الطاقة بكيف نقدر نوجههم بعملية اتخاذ القرار، شيء دخلهم بمدرستهم هم، كنا عم نعملهم امباورمنت، لما يشوفوا البروجكت اللي هم اختاروه على ارض الواقع ومطبق، هم صاروا انهم عندهم كونفدنس اكثر، صاروا صاروا يعني يديروا بالهم اكثر على المنتج اللي هم عملوه، فهذا الشيء اللي كثير مهم احنا حسيناه. نحن عم نعمل سيشنز مع الطلاب بالمدارس كان كثير مهم هم ايش المعلومات اللي كانوا عم يعطونا اياها كقوه عامله بالتصميم فلما نحن رجعنا على المكتب وبلشنا نصمم ونطلع بتصاميم لكل مدرسه صار كل مشروع في له خصوصيه معينه حسب المدرسه وحسب احتياجات الطلاب واهتمامات الطلاب كقوه عامله ودافع على التصميم طبعا نحن عندنا الكونسبت والافكار اللي عادي عم ننفذها بالجداريات هي كانت من الاطفال نفسهم نحن اخذنا الافكار تاعتهم واستوحينا منها الجداريات نفسها الورشه انضمت عدد من المتطوعين اللي كان شيء كثير ضروري انه احنا نكون قادرين على تنفيذ العمل هذا بدون وجود المتطوعين 
والناس اللي ساعدونا في المشروع هذا فاحنا كان راح يكون عندنا مده التنفيذ وصعوبه التنفيذ راح تكون اكبر لانه كونه انه عندنا مساحات كبيره انه نطيح. اكيد انا متحمس اني اشتغل في التصميم اللي صممناه احنا عشان يزيد انتماء له ويزيد انتماء للمدرسه عشان اقدر احافظ عليه وارشد الطلاب انهم يحافظوا عليه. شكرا على كانت بتجربه ممتازه وقدرنا نعرف مشاكل المدرسه وبعض المشاكل بالرياضه وقدرنا ملعب كره القدم كان كله تراب وملعب كره الطائره قضيته زفته فبتعطونا حل اللعبه الملعب ملعب هذا كره كره سله بنفس الوقت زفته قضيه كره الطائره المبدا الاساسي اللي بنيد احنا عليه المشروع انه لما ينعطى الطالب فرصه انه يعبر عن افكاره ويكون كمان ياخذ قرارات يتخذ قرارات كيف يحسن البيئه المدرسيه بيؤدي للتمكين اللي بيؤدي للانتماء وبعدين بيؤدي للمسؤوليه وبعدين بيؤدي للاستدامه It's really great what you've managed to do with so few resources and you know the number of projects that are going on. It's in a way you seem like the research arm of a department of architecture or something like <laughs> That's that. What and, like to have been. You know, and I think it's strange that probably in the universities there isn't really the kind of investigation that you are you're involved with. But I'm wondering if there are some uh, some questions people have for Mohammed. I could ask him lots of questions, but uh, do you have any any thoughts or comments you'd like to uh, to share with him? Yeah, please. Um, hello. Yes, thank you for the lecture. Um, I'm just wondering because you've been trained as an architect undergrad in the U.S., also as the PhD in the U.S. Is there any transition difficulty in like way people are thinking and framing the problem in your native country as opposed to how have you been trained? Yes and no. I mean, um, definitely things are done differently. But also, Jordan is a relatively small country. And when you're a small country, you have to be well connected to the outside world. So a lot of the colleagues I have um, either were trained in the US or had uh, instructors trained in the US. So in some ways, it hasn't been that difficult. Um, you do have a, let's say, a critical mass of architects um, who speak your language. So that has not been a main problem, no. Yeah. How do you come up with the projects to, to work on? Do you, like, I'm, I'm sort of a part of organization in my own country. And we also struggle to kind of, <laughs> we have ideas, but we don't we face the same situation as you probably have. We don't have funding and uh, like, you know, how do you get the funding? How did you just, uh, I don't know, approach people you know like, randomly? I don't know. Well, <laughs> from the political point yeah. of 
Um, first, I, there's something I forgot to mention. You know, I sometimes make it seem too easy, but for every 10 doors we knock, only one opens, of course. Um, uh, also, uh, I mentioned at the beginning we engage in what we refer to as constructive uh, opportunism. We're just always waiting to see opportunities. And sometimes we just really um, do things in the long term. The project I showed you, the schools, it started in 2003, not this one, but we did something in 2003. Um, the Mennonite Central Authority or Central Commission, I forget their name, they were doing something in the Jordan Valley. They had a school there. It was having some problems. They said, would you on a voluntary basis help us fix things in the school? And we did it, and we loved what the results were. This was 2003, and we kept it in our mind. Then USAID had a grant that connected to this. In 2015, 12 years later, we applied for it. So um, we just keep our eyes open. We're always scanning. We're always, again, it's really about a positive form of opportunism. <laughs> and it's not easy. It's not easy. And a lot of things we have to stop. Uh, a lot of things we do on our, our own resources. Uh, but you'd be surprised. Things work out. I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. Hard to build scale. I mean, one of the things yeah. that's noticeable is that you're doing from project to project to project. And I'm wondering if some of the things, like when you're working on uh, agriculture in the city mm -hmm. or something like that, is it possible to utilize your knowledge to kind of turn it into something of a bigger project than yeah. the projects that are always in uh, inside CSB? Now that's a very good question, actually. Um, we, uh, we had this, an experience recently that shows what can happen. Uh, the schools project, you know, we did six or seven, seven schools, actually, although it says six here. And um, the Minister of Education, uh, again, we didn't have a partnership, but again, it was private connections, I mean, personal connections. We knew him. And in fact, he really helped us get the project through, not in terms of support, but ensuring that the Ministry of Education doesn't stop us. <laughs> So that's often what we're looking for, not help, but to make sure that they just leave us alone. He actually is a GSD graduate, um, Omar Razaz. Um, he um, is a planner and an economist. And um, so we kept him abreast of what was happening. We kept telling him what we were doing. And I remember back in the spring, um, he said, you know, I have 120 schools. But he never mentioned funding. And so we started thinking, as, what would happen if we are to do that? Now, we already had been building this in the project. We um, asked USAID to give us money to train about 200 people to carry out these projects. And we thought even if 10% of them do it, that can help us go somewhere. Uh, but we know that if it goes larger, we need to manage it at the beginning. The problem is then Omar became prime minister. And that was actually bad, because now he doesn't have time for anything. So we had that opportunity, <laughs> and it's gone. But uh, it's on our mind, actually. How do we take these tiny projects, which take so much time from us, by the way, and manage them on a larger scale? And we thought that this training for 200 people might be the beginning. We have trained the 200 people. But again, you know, these projects, you get funding for a year or two years. We should probably. We're waiting for things to calm down, but I don't think they ever will. Uh, but but uh, it's, it's on our mind. Yeah, thank you for uh, um, challenging insights in a process that are not normally described so openly, including the failures. Um, I have a question that maybe it's a bit sensitive, but um, you mentioned that the whole outfit started out with uh, you wanting to be independent and you resigned from architecture school. And um, I have done a few small similar projects in di different countries with universities. And I would be interested, what is the, what, what are the main reasons that um, would um, make you prefer this kind of independent outfit as compared to uh, loose or direct association with school. You mentioned a project, or he mentioned a project with uh, Rahul, uh, who works with the school, but does big projects and similar issues. What are, are there more sort of bureaucracy issues, or are there political, or are there economical? What are the main reasons why you think? Um, I, I understand that there is an architecture school in Amman. And, um, how is the relationship to the school and what is your feeling about uh, about this idea of being 
completely independent in terms of advantages. And of course, you pointed out the disadvantages of having looking for, for having to look for funding. Um, we have good relations with the architectural schools in Jordan, and you know, especially the award I think has really. Uh, cemented our relationship with architectural schools in Jordan and outside Jordan. And, and uh, the award is something they, they love to participate in and they're proud to win and they give it a great deal of attention. Uh, the DNA of um, schools in Jordan is not built to allow something like this to happen. They unfortunately are very rigid structures. Um, they do things in a certain way. And an organization like ours, which I can refer to as a guerrilla organization, just simply won't fit. You know, we, we, we do different things. We decide something one day, the next week we might have to do something else. Uh, we might do something for 12 years, we might do something for two months. We're always taking advantage of conditions. These are bureaucratic organizations that just simply cannot do that. Um, they always come to us and one of them said, you know, we'd love to learn your experience. And they asked me to even teach for, on a part-time basis. I couldn't handle it for more than one year. I mean, the bureaucracy was just killing me in many ways. We really need flexibility. It's not out of malice. It's just the DNA is not built for that. And as Mohsen said, ideally, we should be sort of an implementation arm of an architecture school. And ideally, this is what I would have liked to be, but it's just not an option. The, the system, even the legal system, legally, you'll find that the regulations will not um, allow it, no matter how hard they try. You have that bureaucracy, it's just there. <laughs> you know? yes. So if someone... Thank you for the presentation. Um, I can relate to some of what you're saying, having done nine years in the public sector in Gaza mm -hmm. and Doha. And then my dad worked in Kuwait for more than 60 years, and I have an uncle in UAE. Mm -hmm. If someone gave your organization a blank check and could fill that little box with seven, eight numbers, what would you do with it? What's your grand, grand vision? I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> um, the school project, actually, I think is one we would love to do on a large scale. Um, we would love to do it all across Jordan. Not simply, if you look, the, the, the interventions we're making are very small. Although I've showed you the more, um, the smaller ones, we've done some more ambitious ones. But imagine if we do it across a country or across a city. To us, it wasn't just the interventions, it was just seeing the students, um, learning how to design, feeling a sense of empowerment, feeling a sense of belonging, feeling that they are the decision makers. Uh, that is priceless. And I would love to just sort of do it and then train others to do it and make it a self-moving um, process, if I can. Um, there are many other projects we'd like to do. We'd love to move on with public transportation if we can. Um, there, there are many things, but if I have to choose one, I would say it would be the schools project. And I think the nice thing is that we've done it, so people know what comes out of it. You see, like, the, the school I showed you with the flowers and so on, they had a big celebration for it, and they brought the head of education in that part of Amman, and uh, people really get very excited about it. And I love the fact that the students felt that um, they are part of the process. You know, usually they're just told, this is what's going to happen, deal with it. So I, I would say this really is the most exciting project we've done. But again, I always say this is the most exciting project we've done because I'm doing it now. So maybe if you ask me a year ago, there'll be another one. Thank you, thanks for your work and your presentation. Um, I was very captivated by the school project as well, um, and I'm not working on it right now, so I think it has a um, quality of inspiration. I mean, if you think about it, these kids could be the ones who design this public transportation and who do, like, it exactly. spreads the work so exactly. far. So I had two questions about it. One was if there was some plan to track these not track with a drone or something, but like to see where these kids end up in five or something years. Um, and also if there is any thought to using the MOOC or other tools to spread the information about this program to other jurisdictions. These are actually very good ideas. Um, I was just mentioning when, when Mohsen was um, commenting, a main problem we have is that funding comes to us and it ends. And ideally, we'd love to follow a project 10, 15, 20 years. And you know, we, we're a tiny organization. We barely make ends meet. So um, 
it would be wonderful to follow these. I showed you the Aqaba House, and in fact, we just put on our Facebook page a post just saying, you know, read the report we did about it. This was back from 2010, and somebody wrote a comment, we just visited it, it's falling apart. And I wrote back, I, I feel I have to, I said, unfortunately, um, our connection with it ended at 2011. And this project has been made with the idea in mind that um, at least by getting the students engaged, maybe there will be more follow-up and their teachers. Uh, one advantage, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit moving away from your question, but I'll go back to it. Uh, for one of the schools, it's not one of the ones I've showed you, the headmistress, from her own money, actually paid to put a fence around part of the developments we made because on the weekends there was no protection. And she bought some plants to put in the herb garden that we did from her own money. So that is very exciting. Uh, in one of the schools, one of the ones I showed you, at the end, the uh, principal on his own uh, used his own money to just buy lunch for everyone. So people do get excited. And I think that gives some sense of follow-up. But to follow up on your question, it would be nice to get some funds for long-term follow-up on all our projects. Uh, the National Gallery Park that I showed you, um, some say it's the best park in Amman only because we built it uh, using very solid materials, very hardy uh, plants, uh, but, and it's really in good shape in comparison to other parks in Amman. I remember we asked the project then, we said, can you give us some funds uh, to establish some contacts with the neighborhood to sort of see if we can engage them in follow-up? And they told us, and this is very common with um, granting organizations, the moment the inauguration tape is cut, our relationship with your project ends. And this is a problem we are always facing. Um, we, we finish it, we're happy with it, and then often it falls apart because we have not been given a grant to actually build social um, support for it. We're only given the grant to build it. It's a very sad story in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, as you can see, I'm not sad about it. Uh, the, the glass also is, is half full. It's, it's no, not no. Uh, Mohammed, thank you very much for really, this is such an inspiring story. And, and, and as you said, this is like coming to the 20th anniversary of your yes. dedication and commitment. I think it's also fair to say that it takes specific individuals who really become responsible for this kind of project. This is not the sort of project where there are tens and, you know, Lots and lots of people basically doing this thing. And I think there are two or three people together who have really made such a dedicated effort to, to, to realize this thing. And I think it's, it's phenomenal that there is, there is both an investment in terms of kind of quality of design, but also in terms of the outcome of design as a, as a, as a social, in a way, project. Yeah. Uh, which is a which is a very important thing. So may this work continue. We very much would like to find ways of collaborating with you. As you know, I'm glad to hear there are so many people from the GSD community who are who are working Engaged with you with and us. collaborating. So please keep in touch with uh, Mohammed and go and visit uh, some of the projects and go and visit the CSB um, offices in in Amman and and keep in touch with uh, with Mohammed and his colleagues. So once again, thank you very much you. for coming thank back. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.